Hey everybody, it's a show I've been wanting to do for a long time. We've got uh, Ronnie Pontiac on the show. Hi, Ronnie. Hello, thanks for having me on your show. It's, it's a real pleasure. Uh, you know, this is uh, the, a long time coming. I've been wanting to have you on in general, but uh, now we get to have you on for, for specific reasons. Uh, and uh, it, it won't be your only appearance. Uh, you've been writing up a storm. But today <laughs> we're talking about a, a specific book and some of the issues that, um, uh, that arises. And sorry, I didn't put this in the question sheet, but I should start off by asking, what, what is the name of the book and what inspired you to write it? Before I actually ask, what is American Metaphysical Religion? So could you tell me, could you answer that question first? Ronnie. Yes. It's called American Metaphysical Religion, Esoteric and Mystical Traditions of the New World. It was inspired back when I used to work for Manley Hall. One day when I was having lunch with him in his vault of rare books and manuscripts, and he noticed me staring at this large leather tome that was on the bottom shelf with curiosity. I said, that's a good one. You should you should pick it up and take a look at it. And when I opened it, I was shocked to find that it was a newspaper from the 1880s, from the time of the gunfight at the OK Corral, and that this newspaper was called The Platonist. Mm. And it was filled with translations of Plato and of the Neoplatonist, the more mystical side of Platonism, and then had some real oddities in it, such as Abner Doubleday, the alleged but not really inventor of baseball, a Civil War general who fired the first shot on the Union side uh, with artillery at Fort Sumter. He had translated Elephas Levi's books on ceremonial magic, and there were huge sections of this translation available in this thing called the Platonist. And it wasn't published somewhere like New York. It was published in St. Louis when St. Louis was a cow town just beginning to feel the, the smog of industrialization. So that really captured my imagination, and even more so when Mr. Hall didn't really know much about it either. It was a mystery who the people were behind this for the most part. So that started me on a search that continued privately. I'd never intended to write a book, but when I was out touring with my band, I would go to libraries and bookstores and look for information about that and all the other things that became visible when I started to, to pull on that one little thread. It led to the New England Transcendentalists, the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor, the Theosophical Society and all kinds of things. And then because I was studying these things, there was an explosion in academia in the 2000s of esoteric studies because for the first time in the history of, of Western civilization, esoteric matter and history were considered worthy of study in academia, and especially with an, a new kind of attitude, which was, we're not here to judge if it's true or false. We're here to accurately report what happened in history as well as much as we can. And this opened archives that had never been available before and hundreds of books and papers. And it was, it was a real avalanche of these materials and they shed a lot of light on the question of where did the Platonists come from and a lot of other things that that I had liked, uh, I'd gotten interested in because of Manley Hall. And so I often had the feeling when I would find these, these amazing facts that I wish I could have gone into his office with this book or article so I could have solved this particular mystery that everybody had been wondering about for so long. And here it was beautifully presented academically. And the book is filled with that kind of information because I wanted people who might be more on the Manly Hall side of things, in other words, amateur, or as he called it, rogue scholars, or people just with interests in the esoteric and in spirituality in general, to have access to all of this new research that had not been available anywhere. And most people don't get access because the books are very expensive and we seldom ever hear about them. So this was my, my idea was to be a bridge for all this new information. And it was, uh, it revealed a completely different vision of America, astonished me. And, and I wanted that to be something that people could encounter. 
Yeah, exactly. And uh, I love uh, starting off the show with, with enormous questions. So this is <laughs> an enormous question that you were just touching on. But uh, I mean, I guess do your best to answer it. But uh, the title of the book, like, what is American metaphysical religion? Part one. And can you tell us about some of the ingredients in the melting pot as you as you put it in your book? You know, the many, many influences on American metaphysical religion. Yes. American metaphysical religion is an academic category now. Uh, it was coined in academia and it there's still a lot of debate in academia about what it actually means on the one hand there are people who think that it's it's almost a facetious label it's an, an umbrella term that allows us to gather all these unrelated things that come from distinct traditions and cultures from around the world and then we pretend that somehow they're one thing but they're they're not each one is a distinct tradition in itself. And so they think it's a convenience to use this term, American metaphysical religion, to gather up all of these elements. And maybe you could say just as easily um, exotic uh, fringe American religions or something like that. And many people do. On the other extreme, there are people who argue that American metaphysical religion is very real. It's the product of people coming here to reinvent themselves, encountering other people doing so, and then creating hybrids. And, and we see continually these, these influences that pass between barriers that, that weren't supposed to be passable. So you would find people that were practicing Christianity sitting down with indigenous people or sitting down with people who had come from, from uh, Germany and were practicing a form of pietist Rosicrucianism, and they wanted to hear about what the beliefs were and how they saw God and, and what the dreams that people were having might be. And, and many of this, these things were written down. So they think that what's evolving in America is a new religion, in a sense, that, that American metaphysical religion will someday emerge with its own institutions and it will become self-aware that all the people that practice these very similar, although distinct in origin, traditions will realize that they are, have much more in common than otherwise. And then will like, similar to the history of Christianity, which in the early days had many, many versions of itself. And eventually we see the Orthodox and the Catholic Church uh, kind of taking over the monopoly of these practices in many ways. And... And so they speculate that perhaps in the tradition of other cultures where the conquerors wind up absorbing the, the religions of the conquered, that America will be involved in some sort of new hybrid indigenous slash esoteric spiritual path. And then in the middle are, are people like myself who I, I don't really come down on one side of it or the other. Uh, I certainly disagree with the scholars who in the 1950s were very anxiety ridden about esoteric religion in America. They called it Sheilaism after a woman who a researcher wrote a paper about. And Sheila, her religion was to pick up whatever worked for her wherever she found it. And so her religion had pieces of Catholicism, but also pieces of Judaism and pieces of omen reading such as tarot and the I Ching and just whatever worked for her, that was her personal path to religion. Mm -hmm. And academics really had a lot of worries about this creating isolation in America. They called it also bricolage, meaning a bunch of unrelated things that were kind of put together and then you pretend that it's something when it really isn't. And they feared that people who practiced this kind of path would, when they faced the, the real tragedies of life, the inevitable challenges that people face, that they would find that they didn't have the kind of support that, that more traditional religion provides and that they would be lost and would become burdens to society. There's a lot of writing about that done. I, I feel that we've been able to observe this now for another about 70 years, 60 or 70 years, and we can see that this is the, there are things evolving in America. There are paths. There's new religions. There's there's a plethora of these 
these approaches and they do seem to work for many of the people who practice them, even if they are pieces that are picked up from all over. So American metaphysical religion is all of those things. And, and it's has within it, it it's like a distillation or an alchemical uh, elixir made of, of all the spiritual paths of, of the world, because uh, the people who didn't come here looking for freedom were dragged here against their will and, and brought what they could of religion here, of their traditional religions. And all of these, these different paths from every country, from every type of, of practice that have all come here and been affected and changed by interaction in America and the whole freedom of religion concept of America and the openness to these hybrid creations, which can sometimes be paths for prosperity and even fraud rather easily in America, that when all of these uh, are, are looked at as, as just human spirituality, that, that the, the accidents of time and place and language aside, everyone's on the same path. We're all having essentially the same experiences because we're, we're human, we're souls in the same place, in the same time, having these experiences. And so um, I think that that you can see, for instance, in um, the American concept of cool, which kind of took over the world. Everybody was, and still is to some degree, very concerned about what is cool and what isn't cool. And and we would in reflex say to someone who did something that we found to be unethical, that's uncool. And we would describe a piece of music as cool or somebody in the way they acted or even an athlete who does something tremendous as cool or a great lecture is cool. Where did this concept come from? And it took over the world. The whole world became preoccupied with what is cool. Well, it's a Yoruba concept. It, it was brought here by enslaved people who were forced to come here and were often forced to sing and dance uh, on the boats while they were coming over because this, this helped to keep them alive. And so in that way, we're keeping alive certain aspects of their traditions through music. And when New Orleans declared that a place called Congo Square would be the one place that they could gather and, and have celebrations and play their music and, and do what they could of their, their traditions that they were allowed to, it became a spectator event for uh, tourists and for white people who came to view the dancing and the music and it, it, some white people joined in. And ultimately that's where jazz and rhythm and blues and rock and roll, uh, three distinctly American art forms arose from there. And in Yoruba culture and in this culture of Congo Square, the idea of cool was, was just as important as, as it is to us and applies to just as many different things. So for example, cool means that when you face a stressful situation, you have the elegance and grace of somebody who is noble. But cool is also an especially beautiful carnelian bead, or cool is a great piece of drumming in a ritual. So this has passed on to, to the whole world through America and is a huge part of American culture. And that's just, one little bit of this stew. And we could talk about any nation on earth, Tibet, China, Japan, uh, Germany, Spain, India, on and on. And we're going to find influences that are just as powerful. Right. So I, I think some people will be thinking about that, that cool example that you, that you mentioned, but at the same time, you know, the, uh, the, this, this weird, funky, esoteric religion. Okay, maybe it's been around for a long time. Maybe it has the occasional influence, uh, you know, like on, on some slang. But it's not actually that important, right? Like, it hasn't had that big of an influence uh, on important people, historical people, historical events throughout the last couple hundred years of American history. Yeah, quite to the contrary. I was shocked by how influential... It has really been uh, how how many famous writers, how many important business figures, how many people even in politics have had interests in it and had friends that were interested in it. So, for example, there was a Civil War general by the name of Ethan Allen Hitchcock, 
And he was, uh, I believe, the grandson of Ethan Allen, the Revolutionary War hero. And Ethan Allen Hitchcock uh, was highly respected in the circles of, of power, was a friend of Abraham Lincoln. And, and he anonymously published books about alchemy and about the symbolism of fairy tales being actually hermetic teachings. Uh, so he was a, a deeply into esotericism. And so many, in, for instance, in the late 19th century, uh, important people joined the Theosophical Society in its early days. There were many vice presidents. And, and so, and then when we look into art and literature, there's this tremendous influence. For example, both Poe and Ralph Waldo Emerson read very deeply in the Neoplatonists who, again, brought out the mystical side of Plato. And, and so over and over again, we find this, this river of esotericism being a, a very important source of inspiration for people who then make some kind of history. And I'll give one example, one of my favorites, is John Winthrop the Younger. Uh, we have a very specific idea about Puritans, and, and we think that they were very strictly Christian, and many of them were, and we imagine that they were hostile to any kind of superstitious esoteric nonsense like astrology or alchemy. And John Winthrop the Younger was the son of John Winthrop the Elder, the first governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony. Before he came out to follow his father here, he went to Europe looking for Rosicrucians, as many other young men did during those days. He met all sorts of esotericists, and he, he was disappointed for the most part, didn't think that he met any serious actual Rosicrucians, but he decided to devote his life to leading Rosicrucian ideals. And he became a very accomplished alchemist, well known in the colonies for gold making and also for uh, his really wonderful medicinal formulas. He became the doctor to uh, half of New England, really, uh, with trained nurses that had these color coded packets of his medicines. And they would, according to symptoms, they would give them to people. And people even came out from Europe if they could afford it to stay with John Winthrop the Younger to receive his alchemical medicines. He was also, I mean, first of all, he when he came to see his father, his father was okay with him setting up an alchemical laboratory in their house. So the, the Puritan governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony was okay with alchemy in his house and alchemy included astrology. However, John Winthrop the Younger found that it was too conformist and restrictive living with uh, his family in Boston. So he became the first territorial governor of Connecticut, really founded Connecticut. And in Connecticut, he created a culture that was much more open-minded. And according to his Rosicrucian principles, he, not only did he dispense his medicine freely, but he also took care of, of the innocent and weak. In, in this case, there were tribes in the area, for instance, the Narragansett, who had been uh, decimated by disease, and other tribes like the Mohegans were stealing their land and enslaving them. He, at great risk to himself and, and to his, his community, he protected them and he, he tried to, to influence Boston to give them back their names because their, their indigenous names had been taken from them and to give them back their property. And when he, he died, he was eulogized by Cotton Mather, another person that we think of as a, a, an eminent and very pure Puritan, somebody who was involved in the Salem witch trials. Mather eulogized him as Hermes Christianus, the Christian Hermes. Now, I personally found that shocking because either way you look at it, if it's the thrice greatest Hermes of the Hermetic tradition or it's the Hermes of Greek myth, it's pagan. 
And this is meant as a compliment saying that this person was preeminently wise among Christians. He, he was a Christian Hermes. And that's coming from the likes of Cotton Mather. Another thing about John Winthrop the Younger is when he came to America, he brought with him not just his alchemical laboratory, but many of the papers and books of John Dee, the famous court wizard and astrologer of Queen Elizabeth I, and one of the principal uh, theorists, if you will, behind Rosicrucianism and, and esoteric activism in Europe in the 16th century. And he even put Dee's Monus Hieroglyphica symbol on the crates that he brought with him to America. So here we have a very important person and connected to someone who is historically even more important, his father. And in the middle of it all is alchemy and astrology and Hermes. So that's one example, but there are many. Yeah, and we're going right back to the, the founding of America here. And we have alchemists, Rosicrucians, uh, Hermes, as you said. Um, we are going to be kind of skipping through through the ages a bit since, you know, we can't cover the entire book. We want people to go sure. out and purchase it. And and by the way, you know, you mentioned in the book that, that you're not a scholar, but it is an incredibly well-researched book. Everything in there is solid, but it's, it's wonderfully readable. So it's, it's oh, gripping even. So I had a lot of help from academics. They were very kind to me and gave me access to materials I otherwise wouldn't have had, and by example, taught me how to be a good scholar. Oh, good. Excellent. Excellent. Because, you know, I just want to get that across to two people who are watching and listening, right? Like, you're, you're going to have fun with this book. Um, but at the same time, there, there, is, there is a rigor there. So it's, it's definitely not dry. And, and by the way, uh, for those who are watching at home, uh, I'm throwing up intertraditions.com. Uh, that's the publisher. So you can go there. You can order the book, get your copy. Um, OK, so as I said, sk skipping ahead. So uh, what was or as I put in brackets is spiritualism? Like how prevalent was it and, and what does it have to do with the Civil War? OK, it goes way back. And even down into Shaker and Quaker days, because there was a lot of experimentation uh, with ex communications with the dead that was based on the story of Lazarus and the Bible. Hmm. And there were stories of uh, Shaker, young Shaker women who heard heavenly music and then went into trance and prophesied. And they were called sleeping prophets like Edgar Casey would be hundreds of years later. And. Well, not hundreds, <laughs> but a lot. And so we have ha had a history, not just on the indigenous side, where communication with ancestors through dreams and in, in shamanistic ways was common to almost all of the, the somewhat like over a thousand different and distinct tribal traditions uh, indigenous to America. But there were also... European practices and African practices coming over that had to do with this kind of communication. Now, of course, when we refer to spiritualism, we're talking about the 19th century when it really exploded, beginning with the Fox sisters and the, their famous knocks that answered questions. And, and then it became much more popular as voice mediumship, where women in particular would have power suddenly in their lives because women who were they weren't allowed to to speak you know when men were in, in the room basically and they they were considered childlike in their mentality by most people of the time and here you would get a woman who's now channeling a man but she's channeling and she may have 1,000 or 2,000 men in the audience hanging on her every word and she can criticize society and talk about radical ideas and it's all coming from spirit. So this was very empowering, but unfortunately, not only to women, but also to fraud. Hmm. Because syndicates grew up where psychics shared information about people. And if you were in cahoots with organized crime, it was easy to get information about people. Also, spiritualism, part of the reason it became so popular was that there were these dramatic demonstrations uh, musical instruments that would be played and uh, ectoplasmic manifestations of people in period costumes speaking uh, local languages and and all sorts of drama, much of which was proven fraudulent, but not all of it. So, for instance, some of the most popular musicians 
who were tied down and then mu musical instruments were laid on the ground all around them and then the lights were turned out and when a smart ass uh, college student used a brand new light that he had tinkered together in the school laboratory and and showed what was really going on the ropes were all laying there untied and the guys were playing the instruments but it didn't affect their career at all people still enjoyed the trick yeah. they enjoyed seeing it happen anyway even though they knew it was fake in the midst of all this there were some things that happened that were inexplicable and and that were stunning and then we have witnesses who are really ideal witnesses like a fellow named professor wyman who was an expert on ancient chinese dialects and was invited to a seance he didn't want to go he was tricked into going by some wealthy new yorkers because they had a spirit who was speaking chinese allegedly and they wanted to know what was being said he was stunned to find that the spirit was conversing in a Confucian dialect of such purity that there were probably only two or three people in the world that could speak it. And there was absolutely no way that, that this could be uh, something that this medium could know about because this was a relatively uneducated man. His, even his English wasn't that great. And he had no clue about Chinese culture, but was talking about very complicated elements of the writings of Confucius with this professor in ways that that stunned the professor because they were so brilliant so we have a number of those kinds of experiences that just defy explanation but in the civil war for the south which was using the bible to to say that it was okay to enslave people who were feeling that they represented the gentility of the world. After all, in the South, you would find towns that were called the Athens of Georgia or the Athens of Mississippi, and, and who looked at the North as this barbaric, industrial free-for-all. The fact that something like 15% of Americans in the day identified as spiritualist, and most of them in the North, seemed to the South to be proof that the North was possessed by the devil, that this was indeed a holy war. This wasn't about slavery at all. It was about stopping the North from destroying the more civilized culture of the South, which happened to include enslaving people. And so there were many articles in, in newspapers in the South in the Civil War describing the, the spiritualist phenomenon, both the fraudulent kind to discredit it, but also the things that were inexplicable to say, see, only the devil could make this happen, that kind of thing. And, and these northerners are addicted to these necromantic practices. And indeed, on the Union side, you did have esotericists aplenty in, in the general staff. You had people who were studying alchemy or uh, who had experience with uh, mysticism and Paris, reading Paracelsus and Elephas Levi, um, the ceremonial magic side. And, and so, and you had some on the South, like the greatest arguably American Freemason, Albert Pike, who wrote morals and dogma a masterpiece of masonry but he was a confederate general so uh definitely spiritualism uh exasperated uh the split between the north and the south and in the same way that today uh the practices that are visible all over social media on the esoteric side especially among the young are very alienating to people practicing traditional religions in in, in most cases so the the split's been here all along and it's never gone away sometimes it's it's more visible than others and for most of its history in america the esoteric side wasn't even allowed to really have let's just say this it was chronicled by people like manley hall and and other non-academic scholars who did not have access to the materials that that universities give you access to so it was limited and not very aware of itself, basically surviving 
in in small pockets of communities that were were formed around interests such as specific forms of Christianity or uh, ancient religion or uh, tarot or astrology or and sometimes interesting hybrids like Corinne Helene in Santa Monica uh, in Los Angeles who who somehow managed to find the ground between uh, a very sincere mystical Christianity and fairy magic and and fairies in the garden and such so these these hybrids uh, that that came out of all this conflict uh, also caused conflicts and still do. Yeah, can you tell us? Uh, okay, so I, I think uh, another sort of sur uh, surprising interact uh, uh, intersection. Uh, so women's rights, suffragettes, early feminism. Uh, I think many people would be surprised by an esoteric influence here. But can you tell us a bit about Fanny Wright and her esoteric influences, and I guess her esoteric influence? <laughs> sure. Well, Frances, Frances Wright, she goes back before that, really. She's sort of the pioneer in all of this. She's the first woman in American history to address a mixed gender audience. She... She was actually Scottish, born in 1795, and she was uh, she was this tall, auburn-haired woman, uh, very striking. She talks about how, when she was a child, she was in her father's library and she read about America and she fell in love with this country and the ideas behind it, and how she desperately went through her father's atlases because some of them had America in it and some of them didn't. And she was afraid that America had disappeared. And when she found out that it was still there and she inherited money through her family, she and her sister, at a, really a young age, I mean, they were, I think they were just barely cracking 20. Uh, they came to America, just the two of them. And when they came here, there was still in the early 1800s, a fascination with the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And she wrote about how the sailors on the ship as she came over were all talking about this and having really amazing discussions that she participated in. And then she traveled all over by herself or with her sister uh, to farms and, and, and found the same kind of intellectual presence that, that made her at first blindly devoted to America. And she thought this was proof of the American ideal of democracy, because look how educated and aware and, and caring about democracy the citizenry is. And when she went back home uh, briefly, she wrote a book about America that was so enthused that it offended the Brits. And she came back. Her writing had gotten her in touch with people and her speaking with Thomas Jefferson and Monroe and, and uh, the Marquis de Lafayette, and they became her advisors and in some cases her friends. Thomas Jefferson greatly admired her, but she encountered the second time uh, slavery, the institution of slavery as she went into the South and she was horrified. And she considered it to be a terrible uh, danger to America and to the future of America and of the democratic ideal. So she immediately devoted herself to talking about it. She was also talking about uh, feminist ideas. Women should own property. Women should allow should be allowed to be divorced. Women should be able to have sexual pleasure, just like men. Uh, women should be able to vote. And these were radical ideas. And, and she polarized the world, but people were stunned by her. So on the on one side, people supported her greatly because she was talking common sense they thought and on the other side they thought she was the red harlot of liberty is what they called her and she put together a, a community that was based on some of the mystical communities the the really utopias that were experiments that occurred in america and were occurring at that time like the city of uh, the town of harmony and she wanted to use this community she was building to take enslaved people and give them the skills to live free. And then she would repatriate them to where they wanted to go, whether if they wanted to go home to Africa, great. If they wanted to go to Haiti, then she could arrange that. It didn't work out though. At first it, it seemed to, and she wanted to prove this concept 
And at first it, it did prove it. There were newspaper articles talking about how uh, well organized the community was and how it was proof that that all the ideas about the uh, inferiority of the non-white races were wrong. And then she left to do a lecture tour. And while she was gone, all kinds of things went wrong, and including in the press. And the, the place became notorious instead of a good example. And then when she came back, she, she became ill. And the rest of her life story is very sad because she was ultimately forgotten pretty much. Uh, so she was first idolized, then reviled, and then then forgotten. She tried to come back to lecturing later in life, and no one even really remembered her. There was nobody there at all. And and so her her mysticism was a very pure form of American exceptionalism. I mean, she just she believed in the in that America was the great experiment. The destiny of the world was uh, was. America, and that America was the only hope that the world had of being liberated from uh, dominating uh, autocracies such as the church or, or various political uh, uh, nations and, and organizations and such. So we'll get back perhaps later to her brother, uh, sorry, to her uh, grandchildren, the brothers uh, right, uh, uh, sorry, the brothers Guthrie. Uh, William and and Kenneth, who were pagan Christians, uh, about a little less than a hundred years later in New York City, and and that doesn't it's not quite what it sounds like, but but through them she had a tremendous influence on the culture of of New York as it was developing, and I would point to Victoria Woodhull, however, and I will talk about her briefly as the best example of this crossroads where feminism and spiritualism met. She was a, a young girl when her father, who was a snake oil salesman and abused her sexually and otherwise, took her and her sister on the road with him to sell snake oil and noticed that she and her sister were pretty good at intuiting messages that were supposedly coming from spirit. And as they got a little older and they realized that they were actually good at something, they, they believed they were getting spiritualist messages. They got rid of their father and they were able to succeed doing this activity. And to such a degree that one of the great robber barons of the era backed them and they became the first ever female owned stock brokerage on Wall Street. She also started a newspaper that was a rather muck racking, uh, raking kind of an affair. And she also became a political figure. She addressed Congress and she did a really wonderfully eloquent speech. And she said that it was so good because it was actually Demosthenes who was channeling it through her. And she declared herself a presidential candidate, the first female presidential candidate in American history. And then without asking him, declared Frederick Douglass as her vice presidential candidate. She wasn't even old enough to run, but she did this as a kind of a protest thing. And she existed right there and where all of these things connected. She was strongly feminist. Like Frances Wright, she was talking about the right to own property and the right to divorce and the right to have sexual pleasure and the right to have birth control. And, and she, at the same time, was a full-on spiritualist medium who was making her living both in Wall Street and privately in practice by having this skill. Eventually, she got on the wrong side of a very important Christian minister reporting on an affair that he had had in her newspaper without considering what was at home waiting for her, which was her ex-husband, her husband, and a boyfriend. And when that information got out, the, the papers went crazy and, and destroyed her. And she wound up moving to England, where she married a lord and became a very uh, well-known uh, for her generosity to the people that were in the area that her lord controlled, uh, a, a very conscientious and and uh, noble presence. No one knew anything about her her shady past. 
but we can see how she was catapulted all the way into politics and was depending on spiritualism there. When she went up to, I believe, to be the first woman to address Congress, she had Demosthenes with her. Exactly. Well, uh, I think people are starting to see a thread that with American metaphysical religion, there's there's ideas um, and consequences of, of liberation, uh, of all sorts of different uh, liberation. But I think sometimes when people think about sexual liberation and maybe connecting it to the religion uh, to religion they think of like the 1960s and tantra and in what have you but but i was wondering you know we've talked about different esoteric orders on the show before but we've never talked about the hermetic brotherhood of luxor uh, who were they why do they matter and uh, you know why why are they a little bit uh, uh x-rated you know why why <laughs> perhaps are they uh, clearing the way for for later uh uh, uh sexy spiritual times well they come from there's one person really who's who's the the great root of much of this in in American esoteric history, and that's Paschal Beverly Randolph. He's a, a very controversial and somewhat mysterious character, probably mixed race, passed for for black most of his life, but we think that there was probably a little indigenous and a little white going on in there. But there's controversy about what he was exactly. He at one point presented himself as a spiritualist, but then he turned against spiritualism. Then he presented himself as a theosophist, but turned against theosophy. Eventually, he tried to present his own teachings, but people weren't that interested. He traveled in Europe, came back and said that he had been initiated by the Rosicrucians, and then found that the same teachings that had been ignored before were now fully acceptable because they were supposed to be Rosicrucian. And then he admitted later in life that he actually had never met any Rosicrucians that initiated him in Europe and that he was just using his own ideas, but calling them Rosicrucians so people would listen to him. But among his ideas were traditions that were undoubtedly coming from uh, indigenous and Caribbean and African sources, and, and maybe even some some Hindu influence, all of which were were going on, and there you know rivulets of them going on in the American esoteric underground. He started to explore the uses of substances such as hashish, and and of sexuality, and and wound up writing about these things in a way that nobody had really dared do before. So. He's one of the first people in America to write about the idea that one could use sexuality to manifest what one was desiring by focusing on it in the right way at the right time. He was also somebody who uh, was one of the, not one of the first, but, but one of the, the pioneers in terms of popularizing the idea of using cannabis while scrying mirrors. So you would, you would get high on hash and you would stare into a mirror and you would see visions and these would be spiritual communications. And so he practiced it allegedly in a way that might have been more comfortable in 1960s hate Ashbury than it was in the 1860s and, and got into trouble here and there and never really succeeded at a level where he could feel secure and, and lived a rather tormented life. But his ideas had a powerful influence. So his Rosicrucian traditions, because he did have a Rosicrucian order, uh, were taken over by the people who had followed him uh, in those paths and, and still exist today. Uh, some of his other traditions influenced all sorts of different uh, organizations uh, with metaphysical interests, including the sexual stuff. But it wasn't really, uh, with the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor, it wasn't so much about let's uh, have fun sex and get high at all. It was very strictly controlled. So who were the Hermetic, what was the Hermetic Brotherhood of Lexer? Nobody really knows what, what it was. Uh, there were some people involved in it, one named Max Theon, who, who was considered to be the great guru of the order in a sense. He seems to have been a Kabbalist uh, from Eastern Europe. And his own teachings really bear almost no resemblance at all to the teachings of the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor. It had something to do with Thomas Burgoyne, who 
was an alias most likely and a person who probably had according to paul johnson's research uh three aliases during his life and three different careers and uh had become notorious in british esoteric circles as somebody who had gone to jail for mail fraud and then came to america and started the hermetic brotherhood of luxor supposedly under max theon's direction and we don't even know if he really wrote the materials or if some of the women who were involved like uh emma hardinge britain and and some very brilliant esoteric women in that milieu who may have been the actual authors of some of the things including light of egypt that were attributed to burgoyne but that's a whole nother story the tradition of, of that happening but the the hermetic brotherhood of luxor was a reaction to the theosophical society it was partly because madame blavatsky had decided to leave america and go live in india which was very offensive to the american theosophists who had helped her to create the society here and it was partly because there was a, an interest in having a competing western tradition uh, the some of the writing in the hermetic brotherhood of luxor uh, instructions and some of the writing by burgoyne really speaks of a almost a a disapproval and paranoia about the influence of eastern traditions in the west the fear that that through theosophy and the various swamis coming out here and such that there would be this this absolute abandonment of the western esoteric tradition and it would be replaced by the the more nihilist according to them buddhist kind of tradition and they they kind of thought this was a difference between believing that you have a soul or believing that you don't and when the theosophical americans became angry at madame blavatsky the hermetic brotherhood of luxor started aggressively advertising for them to bring them in and you have to send a couple of bucks and a chart or they would do the chart for you and if they decided your chart looked good you could become a member and you would receive instructions by mail there were two chapters one in the west and one in the east the one in the west turned out to be run by none other than the publisher of the platonist mentioned at the beginning of our talk and and he he was the head of the western chapter of the hermetic brotherhood of luxor thomas johnson a baker i'm sorry a, a banker and a mayor in in a small town and the order as he ran it basically instructed people in a mystical tradition somewhat associated to golden dawn style practices but without so much ritual and acquainted them with tarot astrology kabbalah even sufism the platonist was the first uh, place in america where uh, writing about sufism was published and there was this practice for only for the married which was if you wanted to conceive then you were to pick the right time of day astrologically the right day everything had to be be correct with the aspects in your own charts you had to approach the act in the right way and then you would be furnished with a a hashish pill that you were to split with your wife and this would transport you into a higher level of consciousness and conceiving from that place you would bring down a superior soul and later we see a similar kind of idea and a similar practice uh in alistair crowley's book moon child there's this, this preoccupation with creating a, a higher race or, or a savior soul or having a, a vehicle of enough purity to bring the highest possible soul at any rate into one's life if you were not married you could not do this was considered sex magic and if you were not married you could not do the sex magic part of it but you could do the hashish but only for the purpose of scrying and you were supposed to be scrying your past lives or you were supposed to be contacting the angels in the way that john d did so that you could be instructed directly 
uh, from what were called the hidden masters of the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor. The chapter in the East was run by a woman by the name of Aldridge. And ironically, the Brotherhood of Luxor in the East was mostly women. And her husband was a fascinating uh, character who, with her, created a model mining community with a great school and a great hospital and great everything was done so that the miners could live well. And he was trying to prove the concept that you could you could do this, that it was not necessary to uh, impoverish and torment people to be profitable. And he did prove it. It was a successful enterprise, but no one imitated it. Eventually, he just gave everything to the workers. That particular chapter wasn't really quite as as uh, interested in the sex magic aspect of things as the one in the West was. But again, this wasn't the kind of uh, exciting sex magic that we try to think of in the 1960s. This was simply the idea that you used your sexuality in a magical way. And that meant when you conceive, you make sure to do it in the right way and with the right uh, time and place to instead of attracting a low soul, attract the highest. Yeah. You know, strangely enough, it, it's thought that the ancient Valentinian uh, Gnostic Christians had a, had a similar right. So, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, that that's probably stuff that, that they didn't know about, but uh, were, were able to, to recreate or pick up through these currents that go through the, uh, through the centuries. Yes. Um, so, so you mentioned pagan Christianity. So there's people at home right now grinding their teeth. They, they, want, <laughs> they want me to ask about that because that's such an intriguing phrase. So if mm -hmm. you could tell us about these, these pagan Christians, their influence on New York, their influence in the, uh, the 19th century. I will. Uh, before I do that, I'll tell you about one that goes back to the very founding of the country during the time of John Smith and the Pilgrims, uh, a guy by the name of Thomas Morton, nicknamed the Pagan Pilgrim. He was a cavalier, uh, the, the opposite side of the Puritans in the English Civil War, a royalist. And he was sent out by the royalists to compete with uh, Plymouth, the trading post there. And his trading post, Marymount, was very successful. He didn't have any walls. He, he was very different than the pilgrims who mistrusted the wilderness and the indigenous people as being satanic. He was in love with America. He was fascinated by the indigenous people. He thought it was a beautiful country. And he wanted to know all about the indigenous beliefs and what kinds of dreams they were having and uh, what kind of springs there were. And that he was told that various springs had different effects. Some were good for dreaming. Others would heal certain problems and such. And he drew out maps of the springs for people. He became somebody that was depended upon. And he even started to sell guns to the tribes that had been decimated and were trying to defend themselves from the stronger tribes. But the pilgrims saw this as, as the potential for a revolt. They, they also did not appreciate having a successful competitor around them. And things really became a problem when on May Day, Tom Morton made the decision to celebrate as they did back in old England. And so he fell, had a yellow pine felled and they stripped it and he, he put it up on this little mound overlooking the Atlantic, this grassy little hill. And he had ribbons on top of it. And he wrote a body poem in the Shakespearean style uh, to a goddess and hammered it to the, uh, nailed it to the maypole. And then he invited everybody to come and, to celebrate. He invited pirates, he invited outlaws, he invited trappers, he invited the indigenous tribes, he invited the pilgrims. Everybody showed up except the pilgrims and they apparently had a great time. The pilgrims instantly turned this into propaganda saying it was this wild drunken orgy. And Thomas Morton said that quite to the contrary, that he had found that indigenous women were more moral than British women of the time. And that, in fact, it was this wonderful, friendly event where everybody was interested in learning about each other. And there was truly this unity and diversity going on there. But to the pilgrims, this was an act of outright pagan idolatry on their territory. And so they, they arrested him and they took down the Maypole and forbade any more May celebrations. They eventually burned down Marymount. They 
tried to starve Tom Morton to death. There's many more stories connected to it, which you can read about in the book that do not shed a pretty light on the pilgrims, unfortunately. But but he is like a founding father that was forgotten, who really does represent a different kind of America, the kind of America that most of us love, where there is unity and diversity, and we are interested in each other's customs, and we are supportive of people that are from different places and unlike us. And now moving forward, as we get around uh, the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, we, we meet Francis Wright's uh, grandsons, the brothers Guthrie. William was the rector at um, St. Mark's of the Bowery Church. Um, he's the one, this is a church that's still famous now for it, how arty it is. It supports a dance troupe. It, it supports poetry readings and music. And uh, it's always been that way. It was a place that uh, Patti Smith, the famous punk singer, got her start and uh, did a play there. Uh, she had been imitating uh, Ginsburg and the Beats, who did some of their very first meetings as writers in this church. And that tradition was established by William Guthrie. And he was fascinated by, by all cultures. And he felt that a great way to, uh, to teach religion, in his case, Episcopalian Christianity, was to use other religions to appeal to people through the similarities. And so in his church, he had people like Khalil Gibran come in and perform. He had Isadora Duncan come in and perform. He had indigenous tribes come in and perform their harvest dance. He was really focused on, on bringing together uh, all sorts of different inspiration from all sorts of sources. And so when he put together once a, a kind of Bible, it included pieces from Hindu scriptures and from ancient Egyptian scripture and uh, from just about anything you can imagine. All of it, he felt, was very compatible with the gospel. And so he also had planned with Frank Lloyd Wright to build this monumental temple of temples that was supposed to, the, the whole property was supposed to be able to house a million visitors a day. And it was going to have a chapel from every single religion that existed. So you could go to one place and you could visit any kind of church, any kind of chapel, any kind of religion. They would have their place in this, this amazing community, in this giant thing that was going to be built by Frank Lloyd Wright. And Kenneth Guthrie was not as successful as his brother. They never got along, actually, which is ironic. And they never refer to each other in print. Kenneth was, uh, I call him the loneliest Neoplatonist because the, the Neoplatonists were, to go back for a moment to Thomas Johnson, at the end of his life, he suffered greatly because he was a, a translator of the Neoplatonists and of Plato and Aristotle who provided most of the translations in the Platonist newspaper. And he was respected by Emerson and by Thoreau and the other New England transcendentalists as the go-to source, uh, scholarly source for questions about those writings, which were very influential to all of them. And around the time of Johnson, so just before the Guthrie's, there had been a huge like Plato boom. There were Plato clubs. There were Plato was written about in all the popular magazines. There were traveling speakers who would talk about Plato. It was all kind of an offshoot of the New England transcendentalists who were big fans of that. And we look at that today and we wonder, how can that even be? I mean, Plato is so boring and it's the most, is there anything that's, that's more uh, just kind of accepted academic creed than Plato? And but this was a different Plato. This was the mystical Plato seen through the eyes of the Neoplatonists. The Neoplatonists had been discredited for a long time in academia, but had been beloved in sort of rogue scholarship. But some, some kind of fringe academics out there were still putting good Neoplatonic work out there so you could encounter them. Well, at the time of Thomas Johnson's later years, Academics were trained in Germany 
coming to America and we're teaching that all that mystical stuff in Plato and all the Neoplatonic stuff is garbage. That's nonsense. That's not what makes Plato important. We shouldn't be looking at that. And they even suggested that in Plato's laws, where he says that the, uh, the, ver the this council that would meet to decide and interpret the laws or create new ones, it would only meet between the very first light of the coming of the sun and when the, the, the tip of the sun, uh, the bottom of it, just leaves the horizon and you can see the full circle. They would meet during that time and they were to be Orphic priests. Well, there were scholars who argued that Plato was senile for suggesting that. And uh, there's just no way that the, that the Plato that, that we see in the modern world could possibly have had thoughts like that. So poor Kenneth Guthrie was a very enthusiastic Neoplatonist and, and student of Greek philosophy generally. And he kept translating these works and then self-publishing them. And they were all failures. He put these strange notes in the beginnings and the ends that were almost like carnival barker stuff where he would say hello there good looking lady walking by you say you need a, a manual for how to become a better teacher well look no further and he'd put something off color in there like and if you get my my uh pamphlet on how to find a man you'll get married and maybe even by me that, that kind of thing really goofy but inside this he had these very serious translations of very rare Neoplatonists and, and pretty good ones. Difficult, but very sincere and, and learned and maybe not as difficult as Thomas Taylor, the, the one that everybody depended on until then. So Kenneth was pumping out this Neoplatonic stuff into this small group of followers that he had and was influencing the next generation of of mystics so for example manly hall had a lot of the kenneth guthrie translations because those in the taylor translations were really all we had of some of the neoplatonists and he believed along with guthrie that the neoplatonists were how you understand plato and of course the neoplatonists are much more than that because they're at the heart of the esoteric tradition in the west in the sense that in Iamblichus particularly, but, but also in Proclus, we find the, the real essential core of the Western ceremonial esoteric tradition. In Plotinus, we find the core of the mystical tradition. And, and then as we, as we move up, we see their influence on Agrippa and on Ficino, who are really the fathers of of all the esoteric and occult writing that happens after them. And, and so in this oblique way in America, he's kind of, uh, Guthrie is kind of a minor Ficino uh, giving the access to these ideas to people like the young Manly Hall. So the Guthrie brothers were pagan in that they were, they were both, although they were both Episcopalian rectors of churches in New York City, one spent all his time translating the pagan philosophers of antiquity, believing that that was the greatest statement of wisdom that had ever been created. And the other used his church to showcase pagan ideas and pagan rituals at times. Exactly, exactly. Um, okay, so uh, uh, skipping a, a ahead, getting getting more into the twentieth century. So, so we have this amazing heritage, right? Uh, mm -hmm. We're going from the from the sixteen hundreds right up to, as I said, the uh, the twentieth century. But from the nineteen sixties onward, is there is there a great um, um, a degradation of this heritage? I think there's kind of a cliche or an understanding or a common idea that the now what we see is effectless new ageism that's on serious and it's uh, all a self-centered spirituality, maybe starting, you know, with those those uh, baby boomers and continuing on to to the present day. What what would you say to uh, about that and about that idea? I think a lot of that that happened. But of course, this is something that happens in all religions, even the most traditional and orthodox usually have a wing where there are people who are practicing some form of prosperity gospel or uh, it's more self-centered. And certainly the new age was not 
uh, without that element in a big way. However, we also get a popularization going on there that perhaps is best illustrated by tarot. One of the people I interviewed for my book was the great tarot writer, Mary Kay Greer. And she was telling me that when she was a student in Florida in the early 60s, she wasn't able to, to locate a tarot deck until she was told about a, a shady little metaphysical store on the wrong side of town that no one knew about that, that did carry them. And Thomas Johnson, of course, about 100 years earlier, he couldn't, well, not again, not quite that many, more like 80, but he couldn't find any tarot cards in America during his day. In the new age, suddenly there were tarot cards available all over the place. And, and tarot cards have since uh, exploded into a new art form and even a new kind of media. Uh, I interviewed Ian McLean about that. He has a great tarot collector as well as a publisher of rare alchemical manuscripts. And he, uh, Adam McLean, sorry. And he told me that he could not keep track after some 8,000 decks. There were so many coming out every week now that there's just no way to keep track of all of them. That's amazing. And, and so, and they, some of them are politically based and have messages in that way. Some of them are revivals of old uh, religious perspectives or oracles. They're, they're really artistic statements. Some of them are even based on artists like Dolly. And that's, and there are Christian tarot decks that have come out or angel cards. So I think that's, that's something that you, you pay on one side with self-centeredness perhaps, and perhaps a certain shallowness uh, what you get on the other as accessibility. And so when there's accessibility, the shallow side of it becomes more apparent. And I think part of that is because, especially when you're a beginner, most people are very eager to share these wonderful discoveries and they want to teach them as soon as they can and, and get out there and, and share the gospel. And so this again affects all converts to all religions. And when there's a whole bunch of people who suddenly get access to this stuff, we see a lot of people, a lot of beginners who are approaching it that way. When you get deeper into it, there tends to be more of a of a withdrawal from that kind of thing. And of course, it does fly in the face of a lot of the tradition. So today, there is an argument amongst young teachers that holding back esoteric information or silence, if you will, is, is, is wrong. It's unfair to the community that those days are over. The reason that you were silent was because you were risking excommunication or even execution. And, and so you had to be, but now you don't have to be. And it's your duty to share everything that you can with, with your fellows. And, that that approach is different from, for example, Alephus Levi's idea about silence when he was talking about the application of willpower and, and harmoniz harmonizing oneself with nature and, and that how silence uh, in, is essential to magical work. So this is a, this is a debate that's going to continue. Um, I have found... I have found a lot of people talking about how disappointed they are with many of the young teachers that are out there and they, they use terms like witch talk and such. I've, I've had about over 50 podcasts now with all sorts of age groups. And I got to say that, I mean, every single person I talked to was so intelligent. I, I was so delighted to find out how studied even the youngest of the podcasters are. And uh, I, Manly Hall, for example, obviously, because it, it, I knew him, it came up a lot. And I mean, almost every single one of them was like almost like a closeted Manly Hall fan and didn't know how to talk to him, to, to their audience in some sense. And, and so I think we get a bad impression because social media causes that to be the way we do things. It, it, we have to do sound bites. We have to be, uh, sell, we have to have a brand that we're selling. We have to look great. We have to, to get it all just right so that we can get that big audience in social media. Those rules don't work really well on spiritual paths. 
and and so they they can certainly uh, send people off on wrong directions. I'm sure they do. But on the other hand, think how exciting it is that there are so many young people in particular who don't have any sense of of shame about exploring these alternative paths. That to them, they're taking the entire religious history of humanity as their rightful heritage as human beings. And that's something that only became possible once the, the internet happened. And now a book like The Platonist that I could not have encountered probably anywhere else in the world. I mean, you know, some, some obscure university library uh, at the time that I encountered it in Manly Hall's vault is now something that you can go look up and read for yourself online in a matter of seconds. Manley Hall's rare alchemical manuscripts are now online thanks to the Getty and anybody can look at them and, and learn from them. So, so there are benefits, I think, to the popularization. And I'm not, I'm not as pessimistic as others. I don't think it's as shallow as we think. We all start out shallow uh, when we approach this path and, and so many new people are approaching spirituality. And so it may appear that way, but, but just the fact that they have set foot on that path is highly significant and, and means that they're, they're all off and evolving. And I hear stories about people who they start out in chaos magic, and then they go back to Christianity and then they experiment with Buddhism. Then they go back to Christianity again, but wherever they're going, they're bringing the other religions with them. These things are not, uh, they, they take what they learned from one and they bring it to the other and they find a, more depth and and they continue to explore in this way. And I think that's very positive. Well, talking about uh, uh, taking steps um, and uh, uh, growing in knowledge and the, the spiritual journey, can you tell us a little bit about how you discovered esoterica in, in your own interactions with uh, American metaphysical religion? It all started when I was a kid and I walked into a very early, really early New Age bookstore and they had this book on display called Atlantis, the Mother of Empires by Stacy Judd. I was a, a really weird, isolated, kind of somewhat criminal kid. I wanted to steal it, but it was a big, big book, too big for a kid to, to shoplift. And it stuck in my head, though, and I'd always wanted to get that book. And that was it, though. That was I had my own experiences involving what I would call the esoteric. I had I had I just was one of the weird and and had more in, more rapport with animals, for example, even with wild animals like coyotes and such than I had with most of the people that I that I met when I was a kid. And so as I, as I got older, uh, I became uh, more violent and, and I became a front man in a, in a really violent band. And uh, I got very lucky. I was at a club one night and a girl was very frightened, walked up to me and asked for help. She asked me to protect her. I did. And, and she became my wife ultimately. She was Tamara, super honest, uh, super ethical person who who right away saved me from the worst of what I'd been involved with. And I'm I'm so grateful that no one got seriously hurt in, in the scenes that I was I was an instigator of. I stopped doing that at least. And one birthday, I got some birthday money for a haircut, and I took it to the Bodhi Tree Bookstore, which was this wonderful bookstore that used to exist in Los Angeles and was the penultimate uh, paradigm of, of New Age metaphysical bookstores. There I looked for Atlantis, Mother of Empires, but couldn't find it. I found instead the sixth edition of the Encyclopedic Outline by Manley Hall. And it was just beautiful. It looked like it was a medieval tome to me. And I, I just thought it was gorgeous. And it was black and white, but it had the illustrations and it was thick paper and there was a portrait of him in the front. And it, that, it just seemed to me that it was very old. And I'm sure the author was long gone. When I took it home, it it blew my mind. Each chapter that I read, it was like I changed from a nihilist 
into somebody that that had the desire to explore this man's faith in nature and life that there was a rational soul behind all this madness and it wasn't just a big joke and then this all this history that he exposed of people who were risking their lives to explore these areas and to share the information with us sometimes symbolically and sometimes not so inspiring and it changed my whole view of the world at the time i found out that he was still lecturing in Los Feliz, California, not far from where I lived, every Sunday morning for a dollar at 11 a.m. for 90 minutes. And I didn't, at first I, I was scared to go because of who I was and who I'd been. And I, I just thought there's no way that the people that go here, they're going to see right through me and I, I won't be acceptable. But eventually Tamara prevailed upon me to go because if I waited too long, I might never hear him. And then how would I feel? We went one beautiful spring morning and uh, he was amazing. And I volunteered and to my shock, uh, he, I, <laughs> I had had some awareness of languages because I grew up amongst Europeans. So I, I, I had heard Russian, and French and German and Spanish and such. And I had mentioned that when I was being interviewed as a possible volunteer. That was enough for him to put me in charge of editing his alchemical bibliography, which was seemed insane to me. I didn't have any knowledge of any of these things, but he he guided me through. He in the morning he'd let me know what I should work on, and in the afternoon he'd go over it and make sure I did a good job. And turned out that I was good at it. And I also got access to all those books and to his library and to lunch with him in the vault talking about the books. And it was an amazing life-changing experience. And, and he, he was my, my doorway into uh, being civilized, not just American metaphysical religion. So after that, most of my experiences have been rather low profile. Uh, I've been a musician, I've produced documentary films, uh, not really out there as a metaphysician, although I was his designated substitute lecturer and I could have done that. I, I really preferred the privacy of just studying with Tamara and a few friends and not being public about it. And so I did have experiences anyway. I, I, even in weird places, like in punk rock, I ran into people who were deeply into metaphysics in a very American metaphysical religion kind of way. And uh, I've experienced things like the Sekhmet revival, this ancient Egyptian goddess of justice that has become, I mean, let's put it this way. 60 years ago, you probably wouldn't have encountered her anywhere, but in a book by, by Budge or maybe in a museum somewhere, although usually she wasn't displayed. And today, Sekhmet is extremely popular and you can buy almost anything with Sekhmet on it. There's a Sekhmet priesthood, there's a Sekhmet temple, there's a Sekhmet metal band, there's, there's Sekhmet corporations. There's, it, it's amazing. It just came out of nowhere sort of and resurged into history. And so, a lot of those experiences I had came through channels that had nothing to do with metaphysics, through art people and music people and such. So uh, it's been there kind of following me all along. And finally now having written about it and going out and, and sharing the idea with people, it, it's, it's almost like I keep finding in my limited experience that when people find out about it, they go, oh, that's what it is. <laughs> So uh, didn't Manly P. Hall actually think that that America was and has and wrote and lectured uh, uh, on this topic that that America was was especially founded to have a a, a destiny an, an almost magical destiny? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was way into American exceptionalism. Uh, he he wrote two books. One of them, Secret Destiny of America, has got to be like the Bible on some level of of American exceptionalism. He did have some influence i mean you know ronald reagan was somebody that 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 spoke to him and read his writing and i don't think that, that he was any kind of guru to him or anything but i do think that that reagan's uh 
brand of, of American exceptionalism may have uh, had some of its optimism kindled by Manley Hall's uh, example. And some of the scholarship is questionable. For ex example, in the book, one of the favorite things for people is the story that some unknown initiate, although some people say it was Saint Germain and other people say it was an angel, uh, showed up during the signing of the Declaration of Independence when the founders were actually afraid to sign when they realized the gravity of what they were about to do, which was declare war on the greatest empire on earth at the time. And that this person showed up and he gave this stirring speech about how bloodshed would be necessary, but that was the cost of this and that America was God's great experiment and it was destiny and such. And this very stirring story that seemed to indicate that there was some sort of, of a secret uh, initiatory brotherhood or even uh, beings that were, were guarding over the presence of America and that there was a long history of this. So Francis Bacon was wrapped up in this and, and the Rosicrucians were, were the beginning of, of, of its movement into America. And in fact, there were people who had been deeply involved with Rosicrucianism who were involved in some of the earliest colonizations of America. And so turns out that that story was actually fiction by a man named George Lepard, who was a very popular uh, early American novelist. And, and so he did write very Rosicrucian influenced things, but they were fictional. But mm -hmm. some of these things have been taken as actual facts. And I think what happened, my understanding of the situation was that, that Manley Hall first heard the story written down by hand by a Freemason who was a friend of his. And he didn't know what the source of the story was. He never found out. For all he knew, it was never even in a book. So he definitely believed that, that America was an experiment. And this was also a theosophical uh, idea that it goes all the way back to Egypt. They used to call it capping the pyramid. Um, Manly Hall would say that many Egyptians had, had reincarnated to, to help this process of capping the pyramid. And what that really means to cap the pyramid is to put that eye on top of the pyramid. And that was a symbol of a lucid, uh, of an enlightened nation. That if you could bring spiritual enlightenment to a whole nation, that would change everything. And that this was what America's destiny would be. We would be the the start, the catalyst for the universal reformation that had been dreamt of by the Rosicrucians. Now, isn't it interesting that even to this day, here we have the two sides in America very opposed as to how to proceed toward this universal reformation. But both sides, that's what they're trying to do. If you're on the left, you're trying to bring about a world where in, from your point of view, everybody is equal and there's no discrimination and, and there's, there's freedom for all. And, and this is how everyone is supposed to live because this is the right way. This is democracy. If you're on the right, you're saying that's unrealistic. We have to do it this way. And that's the only way. And we're going to change the whole world once we do it this way. And, and really, even though, in liberal politics, you still see people like Biden's press agent laughing at uh, Marianne Williamson and making crystal jokes and such. There's a whole lot of metaphysically interested people on the liberal side, and there's a whole lot of religiously interested people on the right, including people interested in metaphysics. And so that's why you find, for example, if you think of... Uh, uh, Angermeyer, the uh, the libertarian who is is pouring money into the legalization of psychedelics, is a rather conservative chap, but he'll talk about the rituals uh, in ancient Egypt involving the goddess Sekhmet and and how it's a model for the appropriate use of of uh, entheogens for religious purposes. Cool. So we still have both sides of the divide still have this universal reformation mission of America. It's very interesting. And this idea that, that American exceptionalism is different 
from all the exceptionalisms that existed before, because of course there was a Roman exceptionalism and an Athenian exceptionalism. And certainly the Macedonians thought that they were bringing civilization to the world and that theirs was the best culture. And before them, the Persians thought that. So it is something that's common, especially to, to very powerful nations. But there is some truth, I think, to the fact that America is unique it's a place where people from all over the world came to get away from religious conformity and political conformity. And in America, what happened over and over again was a group of people would arrive. They would decide that whoever was running things now in America was too conservative. They would break off and move south, north or east, uh, sorry, west. And they would set up a new community and they would this would reflect their idea about what was right and about the American ideal. And then very often that community would split into into different communities because some wanted to be more liberal, some wanted to be more conservative. And we see this process going on from the very beginning of colonization and it continues all the way through to this day. So. There is something exceptional in exceptional in this way that America uh, is so filled with hybrids. And one of the European podcasters that I did an interview with said, one of the questions was, why are there so many new religions in America? Why is religion such a hotbed for new churches and and new religions and revival of old religions and and I think it's because of that. I think it's because this is a place where people came to reinvent themselves or to, if you will, realign themselves with the divine in the way that they saw fit. And Emerson, the great high priest of transcendentalism, famously said, why do we have to have the religions of our ancestors? Why can't we have a direct revelation for ourselves right now? And that's, that's the spirit of American metaphysical religion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and it ties into what's unfortunately going to be my last question, but it's, it's okay. been amazing speaking to you. And I hope we can do so again soon. I, I have a feeling we will be. Um, but uh, a lot of people feel that this is a particularly dark time for the United States, really the world. But I, I'd say especially the United States. And if you're in the U.S., sometimes it's almost palpable. Do you, yeah. do you think that that American metaphysical re, uh, religion in any way can impact America now for for the good? That's such a complicated question. <laughs> uh, I mean, sure, I want to say, I want to say yes. I mean, it, it's part of the reason why I wrote the book. It's a big reason why I do the podcast as as minor a thing as that really is in the big picture of America rolling forward every day. I, I felt that this. I know what it did to me. It it made me not feel so divided about the country. It made me see that within the great tent of AMR. Even the people who believe the opposite of what I believe can belong in a sense, because as I argue somewhat in the book, much of, of Christianity in America is more like American metaphysical religion than traditional European Christianity. And Harold Bloom, the great literary critic who was a um, very popular writer on religion and wrote a book in the 1980s called The American Religion, argued that American religion is not Catholic, Protestant, et cetera, that it's Gnostic. And that, in fact, all religion pretty much in America is Gnostic. And you can certainly see that so much of Christianity was reinvented here, where it changed from, and not to say that there weren't elements of this in Europe earlier, but we're talking about dominant strains. In Europe, for centuries, the idea was that if you were rich, you couldn't get into heaven, that, that this world is a snare, the pleasures of this world are all connected to the devil, that you, you just hope to get by. And, and if you were a, a, uh, a really devout, strict Calvinist, that even if you lived a great life, you still might be damned because you're the seed of Adam and Eve. And so... We come here into a Christianity where God wants you to be prosperous and married couples should have great sex lives and 
this world is meant for us to use up before the end days. So it's, 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 it's very different. And I think that means that AMR potentially offers hope in ter- if we can start to see that we have this rich background that we, we don't have to be frozen in this stance, this, this sort of schizophrenia in America that's been here since the days of the pilgrims and the pagan pilgrim. And so I think that my feeling about America, I mean, first, as somebody who's interested in astrology, I note that America is going through its Pluto return right now. And famously, that is a very difficult time. And and as a student of history through the lens of astrology, you can look, for instance, at ancient Rome and see that the first time Rome had a Pluto return, many similar problems were happening. There were divisions in the empire. There was uh, weather problems. There were there were problems with food distribution. There was a terrible plague. Uh, there was uh, trouble with war abroad that was was destabilizing stability everywhere, and all sorts of disruptions to what had been a fairly steady way of life in the empire. The second time the Pluto return occurred, the empire ended. So what will happen for America in its Pluto return? Uh, We assume that like any kind of a return, it depends on how well lessons are learned. And I feel optimistic myself about America. I, I love this quote from Bell Hooks, a wonderful writer with a great awareness of, of metaphysical traditions in America. And she wrote not so long ago, um, these days, I wonder more and more why people are pessimistic when American history actually supports optimism. And to me, the history that you find in this book Amer- about meta- American metaphysical religion is optimistic because the amount of creativity, the courage, the daring to, to go out there and, and do it yourself, the can do itness of all these people, even the frauds, and, and even how some of the frauds actually still had wisdom to share that was, was considerable. It just kind of gives you this feeling of, wait a minute, you know, for all the horrible things we hear about and all the struggles that we're going through right now, there's still more good happening than bad on a daily basis the small things, the love that happens, the cherishing of life that happens, the, the friendships between, between man and dog or, or, or human beings and, and cats, the, uh, the people who are from vastly different backgrounds who find each other and perhaps they fall in love or they just simply share wisdom. The way that, that podcasts like this are allowing people to to experience and to talk with uh, people that they might never have heard of or known about and who offer a more intelligent viewpoint on on how to live life hopefully the way that we can we can go to youtube and solve problems that we may have about simple household tasks and such all these things are these small blessings that we kind of forget and take for granted as we look at these huge problems and we try to wonder how we're going to get through this without everything being ruined. I have faith that, that the human race will rise the occasion. All the people that I write about in that book give me faith, not just in America, but in humanity in general, but especially perhaps in Americans. And I think there will come the day when America will shake off these doldrums and we're going to be very excited by by the kind of new cultures and the new kind of science and the medical breakthroughs and all the things that will be just ahead for all of us. And I think a lot of this division that's being stoked now for political power and uh, the desire to manipulate history is going to be a thing of the past. It, it's happened before. It never, never lasts. It always winds up being something that fades off. And all these people who are out there in social media, exploring different religious paths, talking to each other about it, trying to make their livings at it and all the rest, they will be bringing all those ideas, those relationships with the unseen into their lives. And in the past, in America, when that's happened, exciting things happen.
Well, that's a that's a perfect place to end it. So uh, again, Ronnie, thanks so much. Uh, people go to innertraditions.com, order your copy of the book. Uh, if you want to support the podcast, patreon.com slash Gnostic for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. Uh, you can also do one-time donations at paypal.me slash Gnostic. So thanks again and goodbye. Bye, everybody. <laughs>